Marshall J. Raven, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We have with us a renowned astrologer, Monty Taylor. Monty has been doing astrology for a long time at this point, <laughs> yes. decades, and has taken this art and science and has brought it to a level, well, you will see yourself through this show. This show is actually going to be largely educational about what is astrology as an art and science and the way it really needs to fit into the larger picture, both historically as well as contemporarily, as a real way of coming to a greater understanding of propensities, of probabilities, of understanding who we are and where we are in the stream of time. And there's no one really better to speak with us about this than Monty. He has taken this art very seriously. He's done a tremendous amount of good for a lot of people in helping them to elucidate the nature of their character, their authentic being, and their own tendencies and gifts. So it's really a gift for us to have Monty on the show to talk about the nature of astrology and to get a larger picture, as we like to do at A Better World of what is happening on the planet at this very special point in time and to use astrology as a means, as a lens for understanding this picture a little better. Hello, Monty. Hello, Mitchell. So happy to be here. I'm so glad to have you. It's <laughs> really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. So I've given a little bit of a picture of you and astrology, but I'd like to ask you, how would you say astrology can inform and educate people at this point in time, and why is it such a valuable tool for people to know more about? Well, that's one of my goals in my astrological career, is to take the mystery out of astrology, to take it out of the realm of the occult, and to show people, just as 200 years ago, I'm sure someone would have thought this television broadcast was witchcraft because they had never seen the technology of it. So it is with astrology. Astrology is, it is universal cosmic vibration that we are sensitive to. And a person's natal astrological chart can show kind of the way they're wired to the universe. It's not that they are a puppet of the universe, it's just how are they transducing, digesting, and using stimulus that comes from a cosmic field that is then downloaded and transduced in planetary energies, through constellations, through uh, fixed stars. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, it's something that's been explored a lot in Tarnas's book, uh, Cos uh, Psyche and Cosmos. Isn't that a wonderful combination mm -hmm. of words? Yep. Psyche and Cosmos. Cosmos is everything, you yeah. see. So quite simply, we've been taught uh, the last couple of thousand of years be to either fear astrology or believe that it's fatalistic. And it is not fatalistic. It is absolutely... Um, cycles of energy that are transduced. If we're not afraid of a satellite dish, why can we not look at planetary energies uh, as the same kind of phenomenon? Well, it's been steeped in mystery, as you're yes, saying. It's yes. been steeped in superstition. Yes. It has been considered a pseudoscience. Right. And Only recently. Been... It has been, <laughs> before that, it was just yes. the domain of the occult and yeah. superstition. Yeah. And this is so unfortunate because, interestingly, throughout history, the greatest minds in politics, in arts, and science have all utilized astrology. Right. It's just in this heavily dense materialistic society in which we currently live that it has been kind of um, just forgotten about or just been dismissed. Yes. And you are very much a good spokesperson for deshrouding it, so to speak. And oh, I like that word. It, Thank you, Mitchell. Bringing it, sure, <laughs> deshrouding any time, mm -hmm. of bringing it to the foreground naked and yes. showing it for the power that it really does hold. Yes. In ancient times, people lived closer 
to a natural relationship between the earth and their personal lives and their collective lives and a more natural relationship to the skies, to energies. They could tell that the sky was a great big organic calendar. Mm -hmm. They knew when to plant crops, they knew when to harvest crops because certain cycles that happen on a regular basis were predictable. And that's what it really started. But then Carl Jung came along in the 1900s and gave Thank us you, the Carl real, Jung. yes, when, <laughs> when you mix the ancient mythologies and Carl Jung together, you really have something. And you start understanding that the ancients, especially the Greeks, were not worshiping a bunch of fictional gods running around in the sky in chariots. We were taught to believe that much later because uh, the first thing they erased out of a lot of sacred texts in every religion was the astrological heritage of the culture that produced mm -hmm. that religion. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting thing. And a mythology is nothing but a story made up of archetypes. Archetypes are simply characters that we make out of cosmic energies. How do you, for example, talk about unconditional love? You have to make it into a character. How do you talk about a natural sense of optimism as a force, not as a characteristic, you see? And so all the ancients made these various dynamics of the human nature and segments of the human persona yes. into characters so that they could have a conversation, let's say, between Mercury, your mental body and your left brain, and the moon, your intuition and your psychic nature. You could say it's almost, Monty, like what we have today called parts psychology yes subpersonalities yes and if we attribute a certain aspect of self mm -hmm. like the shadow yes like Carl Jung, you know to a particular character like medusa right as an example, right right you know, then we can mm -hmm. see ourselves in a sense spoken back to it's mm -hmm. a feedback loop actually mm -hmm. that shows us that gives us an image a picture mm -hmm. of one aspect of us mm -hmm. and it, it empowers us to then dialogue let's say yes. to converse with that part and clear whatever misunderstandings miscommunications exactly whatever might have been mm -hmm. so if one would look at the planetary energies that are in question and they want to say that one or two of those planets are showing their shadow side. Well, when you have a shadow, guess who's standing in the way of a light? <laughs> right. So it simply shows Ego that, yeah. So when it seems like things are going against you, it's quite simply the universe showing you and can verbalize it through astrology uh, that you personally are in an unaware state of certain facets of yourself. And it's not that they are wrong, they're just not obvious to you, you see. Yeah. For example, um, certain signs and characters when they're not evolved because we're not conscious of them. Oh, let's say like emotional nurturing. Well, oh, cancer, the sign of the nurturer and the mother, when it's not evolved, has love and need all mixed up. They can't possibly feel they're loved unless they're needed. And then you can start getting some more clarity with this. Mm, interesting. So, and then you can still take Mercury and the moon. And Mercury can be, let's say, the news media. And the moon represents the general public on a consciousness level. And so you can see the media's relationship to the public consciousness. Well, uh, what you want to understand is that planetary energies are associated with different aspects of human thought and emotion as collectively individually and nationally and culturally so when you're looking at a planet such as mercury which is associated in modern times we don't say it rules anything mercury is associated with communication with the mental body so it's your logical mind uh, trying to talk to let's say the moon which is your emotional or intuitive style your gut feelings so a lot of people have a constant war going on inside them because their left brain and their right brain are not balanced with each other. The left brain or the mercury part of you should really be uh, used as a translator 
for the intuitive and the emotional. Mm -hmm. Now, let's put that on the collective. Mercury, giving voice to the feelings. Right. If you feel a certain way, you should understand what the feeling is. Not that you're just feeling out of sorts. You should be able to understand eventually and translate it into an awareness or a kind of a thought you can deal with so that you can understand the source of a, an emotional uh, uh, discomfort, for example. Now, when you take that same principle and put it on a national level, for example, uh, Mercury would then be associated with the media. And the moon would be associated with the group public cultural consciousness of, let's say, the country. Mm -hmm. Now, is the media manipulating the collective thought of the country? Or is the media accurately portraying and reflecting the nature of the public mood, shall we say? In fact, we get the word mood from moon. So it's it's a so. yeah yeah we have sure. moods and that's why Cancerians who are moon ruled are moody. So through astrology and understanding the angles, the configurations, yes, uh, the conjuncts, the squares, etc. Yes, you can and the angles, of course, the degrees. I mean, yes, you can determine whether the public is being, in this case, manipulated heavily moderately, mildly, or possibly not even manipulated at all, depending on the configuration. Well, a true astrologer these days, his role is to uncover what is the status of that relationship between the two planets. The astrologer can uncover, is the public in an angry mood, or are they being incited to anger? You see, it's, it's a very powerful, subtle thing, you see, that goes on. And then yeah. you start understanding there are many elements. Don't take one thing out of context. No, certainly not. Uh, because you'll it's, put everything off. It's but, a, actually a very hmm. large compendium yes. of knowledge that has been passed on from yes. at least, if not the Atlanteans, at least the Egyptians. Definitely. And the Hebrews had their own form of astrology. And the Chaldeans, the, Egyptians, the Sumerians. The Greeks, of course, yes. the Romans. And mm -hmm. then we go worldwide. And what's yes. interesting, one of the fascinating things about astrology is that it shows up in every culture. Every culture. As does music mm -hmm. and dance. I mean, yes. it's that yes. indigenous, it's that germane to virtually well, all cultures. Music and so, dance and astrology are communication beyond words. You see, they that's, may use words in some instances, yes, but it's not limited but, to yes, words. Yes, exactly. You're dealing with images, etc. So, how does Western astrology, which you practice mm -hmm. by and large, compare to other systems? For instance, the Vedic astrology or Chinese astrology. Well, all astrologies worldwide, from the Vedic, from India, from Chinese to Mayan to Druidic to the astrology of the Norse people. Uh, they all have their mythologies, which are languages of symbols. All of the mythologies seem to tell the same story in different ways. Mm -hmm. They have the same relationship to the planets, and they named them names from their culture. But, for example, in the case of Mars, well, the other uh, cultures in their mythologies, they had a more aggressive, assertive, figure in their mythology to represent Mars. Why? Because every time any ancient observed the position of Mars, they saw either an invasion or a war or a conflict or the need to survive. That is the basic role of Mars. See, people just limit it. Mars, for example, and all the planets can only work in an individual's life according to the way they understand the archetype. For example, if someone can only conceive of Mars and not being aware of its extensive mythology, and they only see Mars as the gladiator or the warrior, well, every time they start thinking of a Mars transit or think that they're Mars ruled or something like that, they think they have to be aggressive, assertive, militaristic, or that they have to be the town wrestler or athlete, or that they have to... Whereas... Whereas if they understood the depth of Mars, if they understood that Mars is truly 
the energy of initiation. Mm -hmm. It is the energy that gives us the physical strength to endure and start something. Mars really... So it's associated then with Aries. Well, yes. The springtime, and it, it's mm, yes. to govern Aries, correct? Yes, and so if you look the for... the beginning yes. of, of spring. Yes. I love to compare that, since I had such a career in music as have you, uh, Stravinsky, when he wrote The Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not music that's gentle and docile, full of little butterflies and hummingbirds. <laughs> This is the ground ripping up primordially, yeah. giving birth to a new tumult. plants and, and the cacophony of it. That is very often the way Mars is used if you don't have it balanced, you see. Any planet that is out of balance with other planets is a problem in your life because it's the overly overdeveloped, you see. And I've always tried to teach my clients and my lectures that an overdeveloped virtue can become a vice. So someone with an underdeveloped Mars, yes, they can be passive, they can be acquiescent, they can be over-accommodators. But then they think of Mars as the warrior and they think they can only assert themselves if they become angry or if they become rebellious or violent. They have to look at Mars. Or excessive in some way. Yes. You see, originally Which, in yeah. all the cultures, Mars was not a war god. Originally, in very ancient dim times, Mars was an agricultural deity. He was the raw strength that allowed you to have the stamina to herd your cattle or your goats or your sheep or plow your fields or plant the backbreaking work of harvest. This was the raw physical energy of survival. And then it became defensive uh, when your fields or your crops or your cattle were in danger. Uh, uh, you started defending things and you started developing clans and armies Greater and soldiers. Right, exactly. Protect. But let me go back to mm -hmm. the question I asked, which is... Yes. How do these different astrological styles differ from one another? Because clearly... Culturally? No, from an astrological point of view, mm -hmm. they How? are different. Vedic astrology, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, goes from the point of the uh, embryo, from conception, as an example. Mm -hmm. It's, as you told me earlier, sidereal. Yes. It's related, it's a lunar relationship instead of solar. Right. Chinese astrology, something similar. These are actually very divergent perspectives on a similar phenomenon, the stars. What you're really describing is cultures that were thousands of years apart in their development up to their zenith, when their astrological traditions became codified. And the mythologies were relative to their time and their understanding. Mm -hmm. So when we look at very ancient, ancient Vedic astrology, which is very feminine oriented in many ways, very lunar, they understood a, a very different kind of a cosmic relationship of the earth to our incredible universe. Mm -hmm. there, uh, so therefore they used what is called sidereal time, which means that you are making all your calculations based on the position of fixed stars. Okay. And uh, whereas thousands of As years later... As opposed to what we have in Western astrology... Which, which is a relationship to the sun. Stars. Uh, uh, no, to the sun, our own sun. Is the central thing. But when yes. we say that something like... Pluto is moving through Capricorn. Yes, that, that is, a, is the charting of motion. Right. Now, that's what I should say. Uh, astrology really should be called planetology because Pluto is a planet moving through a backdrop, just like this is a backdrop, yes. of stars that form the constellation Capricorn. And therefore, when a planet is going through a constellation, it takes on the character of the environment of the constellation. Yes, exactly. It's S sort of like mm -hmm. celestial feng shui. Precisely. It is indeed celestial feng shui. And it doesn't have to be Chinese astrology to be so. Not at all. <laughs> and you know, none of the astrological heritages of all these different countries and eons of time conflict with each other. 
they all tell the same so story. Interesting. So even in a if different one perspective. begins at conception, right. the other with the emergence of the skull mm -hmm. into the light of day, right. others, whatever they may be, mm -hmm. there is a similarity and a commonality in the story ultimately that's Precisely. told through the cultural bent. Precisely. And the astrological understanding, the mythologies, were a reflection again of the cultural aspect that gave birth to them, you see, the people. Now also in ancient times, your average peasant person or citizen didn't have any astrological chart. It was very common in ancient times that you simply did the astrological chart of the king or ruler, and that was the chart for everybody. So it's the human understanding of astrology that's evolving even more than astrology is evolving. We also have discovered many more planets than were available to the exactly. Vedics. The Vedic wow. astrologers don't use any of the planets past the orbit of Saturn. Even to this day? Even to this day. The official Orthodox Vedic astrology wow. does not use it. Very they acknowledge that something else is going on out there. I, I, I equate it to the Amish, knowing that there's something called electricity, but they have no use for it. So, but they're getting along very nicely and making a contribution to society. What's interesting, nonetheless, mm -hmm. is that Vedic astrology will still hit the nail on the head yes, it with will. mathematical precision, mm. even without the consciousness of yes. these other planetary bodies. You are absolutely now, what correct. What world does that imply? Well, it implies that you can measure something accurately two different ways. You can measure it from the sidereal and the lunar cycles. The sidereal, again, fixed stars. Right. And the lunar cycles, that's why a lunar calendar has 13 mm. months, because we have 13 full moons in a year. Yes. And, um, and actually, our calendars are totally artificial. Huh? Uh, they were just calculated to, to suit history. Wrong. Wrong. Of course they are. <laughs> but we up. can still figure out our way. It's like getting right. around Manhattan without a street map. You can yes. find your way. Right, right. So It might be a little bumbling, right. but you'll get there. Exactly. But these astrologies and the mythologies will reflect very often the times that gave birth to them. For example, Vedic astrology has mythologies. Remember, that was a very different culture than what we are used to today, even in India to some degree. Uh, for example, that was a time when the caste system was considered absolutely, totally proper, and it wasn't until recently that we decided, what, 150 years ago, that slavery wasn't such a good idea mm -hmm. in this country? These are the, tr and by the way, the planet that rules sla slavery was discovered exactly when the Civil War was starting. Mm. You see, so when a planet is actually discovered physically, what the planet relates to starts manifesting in the human consciousness. Right. Can you imagine exactly. if they had discovered Uranus, which is one of the nuclear energy planets, and if they had discovered that during the Crusades? What a very... Do <laughs> exactly. So no, astrology a reveals really things. Really interesting point. Yeah, missing. yeah. Uh, you're also bringing to bear a thought in my own mind, which right. is that astrology, in a sense, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, is the subjective, qualitative nature of astronomy. Yes. Which is a hard science, yes. which deals with the quantitative nature. Mm -hmm. So you've got, in an interesting way, a yin and a yang of one reflecting and utilizing the other. Yes. If you look at the astronomical... Yes, perfectly. Because the fascinating thing, the more the Hubble telescope finds out about more of our planets in our little neighborhood here, the more the planets mirror the myths that have been associated with them for thousands of years. For example, Zeus or Jupiter had love affairs with everything that moved. Well, Jupiter has 67 moons. One moon is not enough for Jupiter. Jupiter was also the emperor of Olympus. Jupiter was supposed to astronomically have been a star. We were supposed to have been a binary star system. Jupiter didn't quite implode upon itself enough to actualize the nuclear fission to cause it to become a star. 
so as we go along, and if you look at Venus, Venus is very magnetic and attractive. If you look at the actual planet physically as an astronomer who doesn't even believe in astrology, well, Venus is the only planet that rotates on its axis the other way. In other words, the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. It sets up a magnetic field because of that. Wherever you see Venus in your astrological chart, you're going to find a magnetic attraction, a magnetic attraction which it So mm -hmm. again, it's, it's always a um, planetary body as metaphor. Right. That, beautiful. That's the subtitle of my book, Astrology, <laughs> Astrology Demystified, and how did you put it? A planetary, planetary body as metaphor. Planetary <laughs> bodies as metaphors, and that's exactly yeah. it. Because yeah. metaphors is how we understand. Because the exactly. magic of today is the science of tomorrow, and we've proved that over and over. So what you're really doing in a lot of the teaching that you do, Martin, yes. and the classes that as well as the individual sessions and consultations yes. is help people recognize the art, of course, but also the scientific basis yes. to the field of astrology. Mm -hmm. I want to just thank you so much for your good work. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mitchell. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. I'm so glad to have mm -hmm. you here. And we'll have to have you on again. We have Thank you. We have just hardly reached the first sphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Thank well, you if you'd like to us. reach any more, astrologydemystified.com. That's the website? <laughs> That's the website. And we'll put it on. Thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you've been demystified as I have been, <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you all next week.